Hello, I'm Beverly Lewis with the Florida Bar Center for Professionalism. And welcome to another in our historical video series. Today we're in the offices of Mr. Walter Arnold in Jacksonville, Florida. The date is April 30th, the year is 2001. And I'm holding a letter which will serve as an introduction to our interview today, a little unusual. It's dated April 23rd, 2001, and it's signed Rutledge R. Lyles. It's to Mr. Arnold. It says, Dear Walter, enjoying a quiet moment following a three-week jury trial that left my client very happy, I started thinking of the learning process that brought me to where I am today as a trial lawyer. There are so many occasions where people, perhaps unknowingly, make a real difference in our lives, and we never take the time to tell them. I don't want that to happen here. When people ask me who was my mentor, there's only one name I give them, and that is Walter Arnold. You taught me how to be a trial lawyer. You taught me the value of preparation to such an extent that many might say I over-prepare, although in my view there's no such thing. You taught me the critical art of cross-examination and art of opening and closing arguments through example. I've always tried to pattern myself after you and the way you skillfully approach your cases. I will never forget the mastery of your closing argument in the Lester Sanders bribery trial. Now that I have young lawyers working under my mentorship, I truly realize how important a good teacher is. I learned so much from you and am doing my best to pass on the knowledge and skills. I did not want this moment to pass without saying thank you. Sincerely, Rutledge R. Lyles. And Mr. Arnold, thank you so very much for taking time to be with us today. It's a great honor. I appreciate the honor bestowed upon me by you and the Florida Bar. Well, with that beginning, very auspicious beginning, I want to go back to the beginning. I want to ask you about the early days in, in your career and I'd like to go so far back as law school. Tell us, please, about where you went to law school and some of those experiences. The way that I went to law school, I was in high school, and my grades were mediocre until I ended up in a bookkeeping class taught by Earl Lehman, the vice principal of Andrew Jackson High School. And I was always good at mathematics. And Mr. Lehman encouraged me to make better grades in all my subjects. And uh, he even took me under his tutelage. And instead of going to study hall, uh, like the rest of the students, I would go down in the principal's office and work, uh, delivering messages to... Uh, the teachers and uh, sorting papers and this sort of thing. And he took a real interest in me. And he uh, advised me that uh, without a college degree, that I'd be regulated to maybe a shoe clerk or a salesman in a grocery store or a truck driver or something like that. And he encouraged me to go to college. There were a few law books in the library, Andrew Jackson High School, which I looked at time to time, and I liked what I read there. And it came to my mind that law was nothing else but common sense and reasoning, and that uh, I could uh, handle the law all right. So uh, I didn't have any money. And uh, my mother and father were divorced, and my mother was the sole, spring, uh, sole means of, of support at that time by the operation of a dairy farm that we had and a farm. So I didn't know how I was going to go to college. But then the, the legislature of Florida created a scholarship known as the Duval High School Memorial Scholarship in memorializing the old Duval High School, which was the only high school in Duval County, until Andrew Jackson, Landon High, and Lee High were created. This scholarship paid $250 a year, not a semester. I was awarded that scholarship which afforded me the opportunity to go to the University of Florida. 
I took the course there that uh, you could go uh, in pre-law for two years and law school for three years and obtain an LLB degree. I took the shortcut, of course. I loved the law. The law loved me. And we got along great. I led my class, and there were about 70 in my class, in uh, grades from the time I entered law school until I graduated. I graduated in 1936 as, uh, with highest honors. And by in law school, I was elected chancellor of the honor court of the University of Florida. And I was also appointed assistant law librarian, which meant that I would keep the library open uh, six nights a week until 10 o'clock from 5 to 6 to 10, which I was happy to do. And if any student wanted to stay later than 10, I was glad to accommodate him and keep the library open. And they would come to me with their various problems, and I'd try to be of assistance to them and helpful to them. I met many good friends that way who forwarded me cases in later years, and I uh, was very happy for the relationship uh, that I had with them. On my graduation from, high, from uh, University of Florida Law School, with my good grades and wonderful records and all, I still had no job, and jobs were not available. There's the middle of the Depression in 1936, and I walked the streets of Jacksonville trying to find an opening. The best that would be offered to me was just office space, no salary, but would divide the amount of income that I brought in. Well, I had no clients. I had no way of obtaining clients. But then Julian Fant, who was the assist, uh, county attorney, uh, that's for the days of consolidation, he offered me a job assisting him and his law partner, William A. Stanley. Stanley had been elected to the legislature and uh, would be away from the office uh, for a substantial period of time. And I was to help Mr. Fant and uh, do the work of Mr. Stanley. And Mr. Stanley represented the city of Jacksonville Beach, and Mr. Fant, of course, represented Duval County. So they agreed to pay me some of $50 a month, which was big money for me and great money. I stayed with Fant and Stanley until 1938 when they lost their majority on the Board of County Commissioners and Mr. Fant was no longer a county attorney. I then became assistant county solicitor of Duval County under Wayne Ripley, who was the county uh, solicitor. My job was to prosecute all criminal cases in the criminal court of record except capital cases. Uh, the judge of the criminal court of record was Brian Simpson, who had been a former assistant state attorney, and he was well-versed in criminal law and uh, was a great judge, and he was very helpful to me. I served in that capacity as assistant county solicitor until World War II broke out. When World War II broke out, I became a civilian agent for the uh, Office of Naval Intelligence and was assigned to Miami. We worked down there for over a year. Uh, William Hallows, the state attorney then, he was also in the same program. I was commissioned a lieutenant JG in the Naval Reserve. But the FBI gradually took over our work, investigating alleged sabotage and matters of that kind. And we were left pretty much with nothing to do. So I applied for sea duty. 
Well, Admiral Fortson was the head of naval intelligence, and he didn't want to lose any of his manpower, and he would deny uh, my applications for sea duty. Finally, after about the third or fourth, why well, he granted it, I was sent to <clears throat> Fort Schuyler, New York, for my initial sea duty training. Of course, I had visions of being a deck officer on a carrier or a battleship or a destroyer or a carrier, uh, cruiser or something of that nature. Well, the Navy had different ideas about it. And I ended up at Camp Bradford, uh, Virginia, being trained for an officer on a landing ship, the LSC. And after about three months there, uh, I, along with eight other officers and a crew of 125, were assigned to a landing ship being built in uh, Seneca, Illinois. The captain of the ship was Captain Roach, and I was the executive officer. We went to the Pacific in that position and uh, went to the New Hebrides Islands, Espirito Santos. And at that time, they were making the invasion of Lady Gulf. And the captain of another landing ship engaged in that invasion had been knocked by a suicide plane from the bridge down to the deck and badly injured and had to be sent back to the States. The executive officer of that ship was fairly young and immature, so they picked me up uh, and flew me to Lady Gulf where I took command of my ship. And uh, not to get into great detail about it, uh, we made the invasions of Lady Gulf, Corregidor, Maravillas Harbor, Subic Bay, Pollock Harbor, Zambango, Cebu City, and Bruni Bay, Barneo. Um, I wish time the war ended. I came back to the States and assumed my old position as assistant county solicitor. But it no longer appealed to me. I really was not too interested in prosecuting people. I wanted to help the individual. So I went into private practice by myself. And I, right off, I got a number of clients. Some of them uh, engaged in uh, the bow leader business <laughs> and whatnot. And from there on out, uh, I was more or less a sole practitioner for many, many years. And then I started taking in associates and partners. And at one time, I had a firm with four lawyers in it. And I helped train uh, my associates and my partners in primarily eminent domain law and criminal law. Those were my uh, chief interests. So I continued on that, and I still practice law to some extent in those fields. So that's just about the story of my legal career. Well, I, well, I wonder, you mentioned a few names in there who, of people who were significant to you in your career. Is there anyone you particularly think of as a mentor? During those years? My mentors were my mother and Earl Lehman before I went to law school. After I got in law school, I cultivated the friendship of three of the professors there Dean Harry Tressler, Judge Cockrell, and Clarence T. Cell. And uh, they guided me and gave me help when necessary. After I got out of law school, my mentors was Julian Fant, who was employed me, Brian Simpson, Judge Brian Simpson, Judge DeWitt Gray, who was a senior circuit judge, and William Hallows, who was a state attorney. And uh, they're the ones that gave I could go to for advice and uh, encouragement on how to handle cases. 
Was there anyone who really inspired you, who was a, a hero to you? No, not unless it was Earl Lehman, who uh, really got me started on thinking about going to college and making something out of myself. That, that would be heroic in a young man's life. He was a hero in my books, yes. And, and I hear the way you speak of your mother. I think and my mother. Extraordinary. My mother was a good woman, and uh, she believed in doing the right thing, and she instilled that in her children. We talked earlier about uh, what working on a dairy farm will do for a young person. <laughs> oh, that was seven days a week. You had to get up five o'clock in the morning and milk those cows and deliver milk. And, <clears throat> and this was for the days of what we call the no fence laws. And the cows were permitted to roam all over the territory wherever they wanted to go. And I had a little marsh pony, and in the afternoon I'd have to saddle up that pony, round up the cows, and bring them back in for more milking. <laughs> that sounds like it might be good now, preparation. Then I had a paper route I cared for the old Jacksonville Journal. Oh, my goodness. Any ways to make money. <laughs> had to. Yeah, yeah. As I said, it, it might be good preparation for a career in law, having to round up uh, <laughs> all yep. kinds of things. <laughs> well, tell me. You've seen such a wide span of history, legal history. What are the changes that strike you most in the years that you've been a part of this scene? Changes in the practice of law? Yes, sir. One is the wide discovery that we enjoy now. When I started practicing law, you went in the courtroom blinded. You didn't know who the witness is going to be on the other side. Uh, you didn't know what the uh, uh, state's uh, case was all about. Uh, now you you make discovery and ascertain all those that information before you ever try your case, which is very helpful and very useful in seeing that justice is done. Secondly. Uh, when I saw a practicing law, there was less than 3,000 lawyers in the state of Florida. Today, I think there's over 60,000 lawyers in the state. At that time, when I saw a practicing law, lawyers were well-respected. They uh, were looked up to. Uh, they were gentlemen. And they practiced law because they loved it and not just for the money in it. Uh, we have a few bad characters that chased ambulances and so forth, and they got rid of them. Now, you have advertising, which I despise. I'm not saying that the lawyers that advertise are uh, not qualified, but going out and, and advertising to get clients and uh, holding themselves out and tooting their own horn, just cheapens the profession in my books. And in the eyes of the public, I think, has done the same thing. And that's one reason why the lawyers today are held in such uh, low esteem. That movies, TVs, which show lawyers in a bad light, has all uh, caused a degeneration in the image of the lawyer. Now, uh, this day and time, we have a uh, uh, lot of minorities, so-called minorities, in the practice of law, which I think is a good thing. The women, particularly, uh, most of them are hard workers, and they want to be successful, and they're very good. So that's been an accomplishment. Uh, but those are the, the major changes. And another change, though, I should mention. Back when I started practicing law, most, the great majority of lawyers uh, were general practitioners. They handled divorces, civil suits, <coughs> criminal cases, whatever came in the office they handled. Because of the complexity of the law today, 
That's no longer possible, really, as a practical matter. You have to specialize and do two or three features of the law, and that, that's it, period. And really, it's a, it's a good thing because uh, uh, the lawyer that specializes is much more competent in that field than the general practitioner was back in the old days. I wonder what advice you would give to members of your profession. You talked about seeing some of the changes that, that distress you. What do you think might be done to, uh, to improve or to, to work for, for the better in, in your profession? The main thing that I think would be uh, for the better would to instill in the law student and young lawyers a better relationship between the lawyer and his client. Uh, to the client, when he has a lawsuit, are in trouble in criminal law. That is a, a big chapter in his life. That's what he's thinking about day and night. And he wants to be advised and informed. And it's the duty and obligation of the lawyer to keep his client informed and have frank and honest discussions with the client of, of uh, the, his chances if he goes to trial, uh, what to look for, uh, what his uh, best hope of success might be that sort of thing, and keep up that relationship all the way th through the attorney-client uh, connection, uh, right through to the end. Now, that what brings other clients to you, in my opinion. The fact that you're honest with your client, you keep him informed or her informed, and they know what's going on. That's, that's the uh, best thing. Another thing is for the lawyer to be prepared to study the case, to interview the witnesses. I don't leave it up to some uh, private investigator to uh, interview witnesses. I want to interview particularly the main witnesses. I want to look at them and see what I think about their character and whether they're telling me the truth or not and uh, to make my, draw my own conclusions in reference to the witnesses. And to not only be prepared so far as the factual situation is concerned, but don't depend on the judge to know all the law. He can't possibly know all the law. Be prepared in the law and write up memorandums for the court to read and to help you understand uh, the case and to rule accordingly. All those things uh, uh, are very, very important. But the attorney-client relationship is most important. Another thing, too, I think the law schools today should instill in the law students and young lawyers uh, the uh, respect for their fellow lawyers, and the court. Now, the court may not be the best, it may not be experienced, but after all, it's the court, not the individual, that you're showing respect for. And at all times, be respectful to them, and be respectful to your fellow lawyers and the witnesses. The witnesses, most of them are there against their will and consent anyway, and you don't need to be abusive to them. Get out. Be aggressive. Get the knowledge out of them that you want, the information. But don't be abusive. You don't have to be that. And you don't have to be abusive to your fellow attorneys either. I liked what you said earlier when we were talking about that and about preparation. You said, know the case better than the witness knows the facts of the case. Know more about the case than your own client knows about it. And, and how do you do that besides, well, you talked about spending time with the witnesses. You talked about 
knowing the law, but what is your particular personal secret for the success of that? Of knowing the witness? Yes. How do you, how do you analyze well, the people? You know, after you go through this thing time and time again, particularly the prosecutor and a defense attorney, you get, develop a knack of knowing whether they're shading the truth or whether they're really trying to uh, tell you everything that happened and the full knowledge that they have about the matter. Uh, it's just one of those things that you develop. So, Sounds like a lot of... In the of same way with your client. Mm -hmm. uh, now, when your client comes in the first interview, you just don't accept everything that he says as being absolutely the truth. You question him, and, and uh, if there's doubt in your mind about certain facts, you bear down on it to find out what the truth is, because it's uh, absolutely essential. In order to be a successful lawyer and successful in the case, that you have the truth out of your client to start with. If you start out on a falsehood, you're in bad shape. You talked earlier about... Uh Law schools, law students. I wonder, what do you think of, of a mentoring program, an official sort of mentoring that's maybe a little more structured than the kind of informal mentoring that might have happened in previous years? Well, most of my experience has been informal mentoring. And I always cultivated the friendship of a more experienced, uh, lawyer, older and more experienced lawyer or judge. For instance, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Fant, he was quite experienced and uh, quite a bit older than me. And also uh, Judge Simpson and uh, Judge Gray William Hallows, the state attorney, I cultivated their friendship. Well, I'd take them to lunch every now and then, and uh, uh, where I could feel that I could go to them with my problems and get good advice. Now, so far as a formal mentorship is concerned, I think that'd be a, a pretty good idea, too, to work along these lines. Uh, most older lawyers, they have more time on their hand, and it's a compliment, really, to them to have a young lawyer seek their advice and judgment about matters. And semi-retired lawyers, they're, they're quite willing to give their time and uh, patience and advice to uh, young lawyers and to help them with their problems give them recommendations and whatnot. And I think uh, that the, really the young lawyers starting out, right out of law school, need assistance of that kind, very much so. I had it. I was very fortunate to have very good mentors. What do you feel that the legal profession is doing correctly? How, how is it succeeding these days from your perspective? I think the, the uh, legal profession is doing correctly in advocating the uh, seminars that do the educational programs that's being carried on today, which brings the lawyers up to abreast of uh, what the law is, because with all the appellate courts we have this day and time, grinding out opinions is very, very hard to keep abreast of the, of the major opinions, which would be helpful to them. Another thing in the field of discovery, I think they've done an excellent job there. Another thing that they're doing, the bar, the Florida bar, is uh, discipline. Some of these uh, lawyers that probably shouldn't have been lawyers in the first place, particularly those that neglect their clients, take their money, and don't do anything for them, 
Uh, I don't approve of that at all or invade their trust accounts, uh, do other things uh, unethical, uh, illegal, unlawful, and uh, do not follow any moral standards. Get rid of them. And that's what Florida Bar is doing, which is a good thing. You know, it seems to me that you talked about your experiences in the war as redirecting your law career, that you really refocused uh, on a different avenue of practice after that. And I wonder, would you talk a little bit about that for us? Well, it did have a great impact on me. Back uh, when I first started in practicing, practicing law, and an assistant county solicitor, Believe it or not, I was rather timid and self-conscious and uh, afraid maybe to do this, that, and the other. But in that man's navy, when you were out there in the captain of a ship and everything was resting on your shoulder, you had to take responsibility. You had to make decisions and make them now. And you didn't have to, the, the luxury of calling on somebody else for advice. You had to do it yourself. And it taught me to be a person that stands on his own two feet, does his own thinking, and accepts responsibility. And that's when I decided, after I got out of the Navy, that I would be a, a sole practitioner defending people accused of crime or whose property was being taken by eminent domain in similar cases. You said it was the, the responsibility of having all those people's fates in well, the palm of your hand. I had a crew of 125. I had eight officers under me, and we went in on an evasion. We carried 500 troops, and I was the man that had to see where the, the minefields were, where the uh, uh, shoals were, where the Japanese fortifications were, and all that is my responsibility. Nobody else. And you can push it off on anybody else. And it seems like there's a clear corollary between that kind of personal responsibility in battle to what you described as a big chapter in somebody's life when they're need in need of counsel. That's right. But... Whereas well, a big chapter in somebody's life is only one life. Back then in the war, it was hundreds of lives that depended on you. That's very, very true. What is your definition then of professionalism to go above and beyond? Professionalism includes ethics, not only the ethics of the Florida Bar, but also good moral standards the difference between right and wrong, knowing that, uh, your moral integrity, honesty. Professionalism goes further than that, though. It means uh, competency. Uh, it also includes preparation of your cases, uh, wanting to help your client, a good attorney-client relationship where the client's not afraid to ask you uh, what's going on, and you should tell him what's going on. Keep him or her advised. That's important to them, very important, a lot more important than it is to you. And to uh, be respectful to your fellow lawyers and uh, the judge, the court, and to conduct yourself properly and uh, through hard work and preparation, you'll be able to win your cases and you do it in a professional sort of a way. That's professionalism. You sound like a man who has had a strong moral compass his whole life. What would you say were the core beliefs or values of your life that have led you to this path? The core of my life, particularly since the war, is to help my fellow man be helpful. And when you're helpful, it not only helps the person, but it helps you. It makes you feel better. It makes you want to keep on doing the same thing. 
Let me ask you, if you could wave a wand or if you knew that your advice or your exhortation were going to have a complete effect, a profound effect on your profession, on law schools, uh, on, on the judiciary, what advice would you give if you knew that it were going to be followed? Hmm. Well, as to the legal profession, my advice would be that the law schools and the courts should determine who really likes the law and practices the law for the profession itself and because the lawyer is interested in the law and seeing that justice is done. And that those that are in there purely for making money, get rid of them. Get rid of them. Uh, discourage them from being lawyers. They have no place uh, in, the, in the marketplace. And uh, they will never really be great successes and never be too helpful to the profession. Mr. Arnold, thank you so much for your time. This will this day will live, I think, for many of us. And I enjoyed the interview thank very you, much. I hope I can be of help to others. I can't see how you can fail to be of help. Thank you, sir. Thank you.